Okay, um, in today's lecture we're looking at Chekhov. Uh, some of the important things to keep in mind when uh, reading Chekhov are the way he doesn't use conventional characters uh, in a sense. There are no clear heroes, villains. Um, and this is often a common theme in, in, in Russian realist literature. Uh, you find that in often uh, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky before, the fact that there are no very clear, clear heroic um, figures often. Uh, the, 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 the personalities of the characters are complex, multi-layered, um, and have complex psychological profiles. And I think that's a, that's a crucial point. And because we're getting into the period where uh, psychology, psychoanalysis, um, ideas of subconscious, um, uh, all, all these ideas are, are coming into European thought. Um, so he's anticipating a lot of these ideas. So as well as the idea of no clear-cut, straightforward sort of uh, archetypal sort of characters, um, th there's also often a lack of a clear plot or narrative as well in a traditional sort of uh, sense of of, of something un, un, unfurling and um, reaching a kind of climax of, uh, uh, of, of conflict or tension and then kind of a resolution at the end. So there's often, you're left hanging at the end of it. Um, uh, often, yeah, no, no shocking revelations or, or something radically unexpected. You can almost, pre almost kind of predict sometimes that... The, what would happen based upon the, the kind of personalities of of, of the of of the characters? Um, uh, focus on. The, there's also a focus on uh, a particular moments, particular mundane moments small detail moments, the kind of uh, the kind of things that were often overlooked in stage dramas um, uh, at, at the time. So uh, particular every every day, um, the things in between when people are giving sort of you know impassioned speeches or doing doing important acts, the, the little everyday things. And I like to think of Chekhov in this way as a precursor to say Seinfeld, we'll talk about Seinfeld in another class, that you can't really understand Seinfeld, or Seinfeld wouldn't have been possible without someone like Chekhov before before him. I mean, you notice the characters in Seinfeld are often very similar to say the characters in A Cherry Orchard or the characters um, in Lady with the Dog, they're kind of all somehow corrupted, imperfect, bumbling. Um, uh, there's often no kind of the idea in Seinfeld that you know it's a story about nothing. I mean that's kind of that's kind of a very Chekhov thing, um, and and little themes and tropes sort of interplaying and 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 evolving and and uh, uh, throughout the story, and then kind of link, kind of um, coming together in strange almost comical ways being tied together um, in an almost nonsensical way almost. So it's, uh, there is that um, uh, that that legacy aspect to check off how important he is that he, he wasn't just a writer for the 19th century but really uh, there wouldn't be modern sitcoms if there, there, there wasn't a, a, a check of like well, well check off. Um, uh, also, from the moral perspective, there's often he's not he doesn't present clear moral characters or clear um, moral teachings in, in in his dramas. It's 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 not like the the, 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 the classical Greek dramas where there was um, the, the a clear often clear sort of um, messages. Um, and even in a popular drama of his time, that he was reacting against um, uh, the popular stage shows. Uh, in Russia and the popular stage shows coming out of France um, where there were kind of nice sort of middle class or aristocratic families um, and and kind of trying to exemplify um, 
norms of propriety and good good behaviour, um, or at least messages of of, of uh, providing examples of, of of how how to 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 act in a sort a certain sort of normatively appropriately sort of behaviour. Um, yeah, so the. the there's ambiguity, moral ambiguity, no clear lines between good and bad. Um, uh, and we can link this in with Nietzsche as well, the idea of Nietzsche sort of the overcome, well, looking at the idea that there's, the, the, there's so, unfortunately, there's so little good in goodness that often good characters, there's something not, not quite nice about people who are on the surface very good often at times. And often sort of bad characters or or individuals that have huge, huge sort of character flaws, there, there, there's something, often something, there, there can be something about them that is very good. And that, that was a theme that was also explored in, in, in Tolstoy in Russian literature before. So that's, that's not, not new to, to, to Chekhov, but um, he, he is definitely working within that, that, that framework of breaking down conventional morality and, 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 uh, Showing the, the the seedy underbelly of society. That's what we call him a realist. He's he, he he's showing the flaws in all segments of society. He's not idealizing the peasants like Tolstoy did. Um, he, he he's not showing the aristocrats as moral leaders. He's showing them as degen as they are degenerate. He's show he's poking fun of students. He's poking fun of peasants. He's poking fun of um, the middle class. He's poking fun of everyone. Um, uh, so everyone, all the characters come out looking corrupt and inadequate. Um, uh, so, yeah, so in, in, in that sense, what he's attempting to do is to, to see reality as it really is. Um, uh, that reality is at its most dramatic often, at its most mundane. There's a story of when he travelled to, to Italy, he wasn't concerned of seeing the, the great buildings and the great sites, but he was focusing his attention on, on the small details of the porters and the, and the, the life around him. Um, and I think that kind of, that, that, that's a secret to, to, a key to his realism, that he, he focuses on often the events that say, like, uh, that conventional drama will think of all, all the times in between where nothing is happening. That's when he's drawing the attention to, like sitting down on a breakfast table. I mean, uh, the you know standing around chit chatting on a sofa. All these boring, inactive things that uh, traditional dramas would kind of skip over and get to the action part. He he's making that the action part, and he's able to do that because for him, action act, act and activity aren't external but internal so he's making that distinction between internal activity and external activity and in a sense there's a strong christian aspect to that because uh there's an understanding of the the inner person saint paul that kind of the 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 uh, the um uh the in the, the inner man the inner in inner person and he's focusing on that inner psychological activity and often the the inner activity reach uh, is at its most dramatic at times when external activity is at its most boring. Um, so, uh, so I think that's kind of a, a genius of, of, of Chekhov, that he somehow manages to, to in a very subtle way, to uh, uh, um, paint an interior landscape in his dramas. Um, so... Uh, yeah, there, there's that aspect. So, uh, so he's taking he's taking the reader on on a journey of of moods over actions in a sense. So so moods, feelings, um, the mood of a room, the atmosphere, the, the the psychological atmosphere of the room, and I think that's kind of a, um, and I think perhaps. That, that's one of the great things about reading literature is that kind of by, by seeing it on paper, hopefully I think 
it will help to accentuate your own ability to discern moods and rooms and atmospheres and kind of uh, uh, by, by paying attention to that as it's, it's explored um, in a literary work that in your real day-to-day -day life you'll be able to pay attention to things that perhaps otherwise you wouldn't pay attention to. Um, so there's that a aspect. Uh, if if we get onto his personal life, um, uh, uh, he was really interesting in 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 many ways. Um, oh, that's right. You can just take a seat over there. Maybe one over there and one over here. One over here. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, he was a complex character from a, a, a merchant family in, in in southern Russia. So low low class, well not low class, lower middle class sort of family. His father was from a serf background, um, basically a peasant background. Uh, strong religious education, um, as well as access to the schooling system. Um, so he had a, a quite a good education. Um, his, his dad was a, a poor businessman, lost money and then ran off to Moscow and he was left looking after his younger brother. So we see this pattern develop of him caring for other people. This is a crucial aspect to his personality. Uh, so uh, uh, later he'll become a doctor. So it's amazing he somehow manages, managed to undertake medical education, became a doctor, worked caring for, for the poor poor people often who couldn't afford to pay him work being called out all hours of the night um, doing his his medical practice and then writing for for newspapers on the side as well so churning out little articles each week um, for the newspaper so it's kind of you know it's amazing to think how that you could be a doctor and and, and all that pressures and, and still produce works um, as as well and his earlier works were often uh, kind of, they were for public consumption, they were popular. Uh, but but something, something happens, uh, something very, very strange happens to him. Uh, along the way, he, he wants to explore the, the, the penal colony of Sakhalin, that's all the way over in, uh, the, on the eastern side of Russia, so all the way in Asia, right next to China. Um, and somehow he manages to find a way to travel all the way to Sakhalin by, by train, by boat, even by, by coach drawn with the carriage drawn by horses and things like that. And he somehow gets all the way over there. Um, and when he gets there, he's shocked. It's pretty much a gulag, you know, what we'll call a gulag now. But perhaps not as bad as the Soviet gulags, but still nonetheless a horrendous place where people are chained to wheelbarrows, working themselves to death almost, and, uh, well, literally working themselves to death. Um, children, um, in, in, you know, completely malnourished, um, being treated horrendously. Um, it was just an absolutely horrific situation. Um, and he somehow manages to get in there and have a look at this, uh, and then when he when he uh, when he goes back to Western Russia, when he goes, he, he he tries to work to improve the actual situations here. So it was an actual social reformer. He had this aspect to him. He he tried to improve the situation of the of the particular children in the penal colony. He tried to improve the situation of his local library and his local town. Um, but for his work, the interesting thing is that after visiting the penal colony, that's when his, his work just takes on a whole different character. Um, that he becomes one of the most profound writers uh, in world literature after this, after this particularly after this period. Um, uh, and, and, and that's... Uh, so I think there's something there that can't be explained rationally. That what, I mean, imagine us now, imagine you deciding you want to trek all the way, say, that's the equivalent of us saying going all the way to, say, an offshore detention centre in Nauru or something like that, somehow managing to find our way to get there, um, hitchhiking, um, and, and then having your whole personality almost changed. Uh, something something changes, and after this, um, he, he's 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 producing works of, um, uh, well, the kind of works that we're reading in this course, um, and there's an idea that the, a crucial aspect to, to to creative genius isn't 
there's something that goes beyond technical capacity and that there's something transformative there's something um, almost spiritual about uh, uh, something that can't be reduced to something moral something that can't be reduced to just technical proficiency um, and there's I think there's a link between that sort of that sort of pilgrimage to the East he made um, that sort of confrontation with suffering and that taking on that suffering and and, and, and the, 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 the the almost Shakespearean like work that he created after that which is I, I, I think um, amazingly profound um, that, uh, that idea that it's kind of in the suffering uh, and he had no shortage of suffering in his own life he had a dad that used to beat him and it was no good and kind of um, he, so he had a pretty he had no childhood as far as he was concerned um, so he had a he didn't have an easy life and working as a, a doctor cr contracted c tuberculosis quite young in his 20s so he knew from from quite young that his life would be short and he died around 40 years old so um, so the, his whole life he had these intimations of his the the, de the the miserable death that he'll 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 you know he'll have so uh, and he was surprised he lasted as long as long as he did um, so the, there's no short of the suffering in his life and I think that's kind of linked to um, his genius in in a way um, so my. He, unlike the other Russian realists like Tolstoy, he wasn't an aristocrat. He wasn't, you know, from the kinds of families that Turgenev, Lermontov, or Dostoevsky were from. He was from a much lower social class. So he didn't have that luxury of being able to sort of just write at his leisure. He kind of, and that's another amazing thing, that amazing energy. He worked as a doctor during the day um, and, um, you know, wrote for a living, had to write to make his money. Um, and then also mm. producing the, these works of outstanding genius. And compared to, say, Tolstoy, who came before, Tolstoy's massively long, worn piece, and even Dostoevsky's, the Brothers Karamazov, that kind of massively long works. And then, then he produces these kind of miniatures, a few pages long. But even though they're only a few pages long, there's kind of something... Almost, as, as he creates a. He still manages to create a whole world in those few pages, in the same way Dostoevsky. I mean, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky managed to create worlds in their massive works. Um, and there's something also amazingly profound about the insights he manages to achieve in such a, a small space. And that's kind of there's a genius to that, I think. Um, and there's also something Shakespearean about it. Have you noticed? There's almost kind of. The high point in, in, in Shakespeare's dramas, uh, uh, there's all, almost something achieved of that achieved um, in, 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 in readings, uh, well, in, 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 his, um, in his works. Um, and, and I think there's, there's no coincidence uh, that this Shakespearean-like aspect to, to his writings was also because he, um, he was able to see Shakespeare's plays at, at the theatre in, in his hometown as well. So... Um, there's that aspect to it. Uh, so while he starts off writing popular work, popular drama, um, goes to the East, uh, uh, has this profound sort of some some experience, something's happening to him, and then he comes back, and then he kind of he's writing the, these almost immortal works of 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 of, of Western genius, um, uh, and something that we're still reading today. So. Yeah, so it's that kind of, but at the same time, working within the genres of the popular narrative. I mean, uh, the the popular. Um, I mean, he started his career working in, in uh, writing popular little pieces for newspapers and then uh, little dramas um, for for stage for popular audiences. And he still throughout his life he continued writing dramas and, and short stories. So still kind of within the genre of these popular forms, but the, at the same time it's not popular work. It becomes classical or great work. Greatness comes in. So he takes the popular genre and turns it into something great. And I don't think that that's really rare if you think today. I mean, have you seen a sitcom that goes from being popular to something absolutely great in the, in the sense of something 
they can be regarded as classically high culture, something that would last hundreds of years. Maybe Seinfeld gets there, but maybe not. I don't think so. Um, it gets close, but it doesn't get there. So to, to take a popular form and then really transform popular sort of medium um, and 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 you know, trans like the and transform it. Um, uh, it, it it's like writing an article for the Courier Mail or something being a journalist for the Courier Mail and then eventually you produce something in the Courier Mail um, <laughs> that's a, a, a work of art in its own right um, it's it, it doesn't you don't expect a, someone who's writing for the Courier Mail to produce anything that would is worth reading let alone um, you know reading a hun over a hundred years later so that's uh, that, that's the, that's kind of the con that's kind of the situational context of, of his work so uh, in terms of the technical aspects to pay attention to uh, I mean, there's a musical aspect uh, to his work. They're short. They're, 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 there's a musical poetic aspect. You almost have to read his short stories like poetry, in a sense. Uh, look at the, the structure of the paragraph, structures of the sentence, because the, the pace, the cadence changes. So he's playing almost poetically, uh, not in a, in a way that you expect of traditional narrative of just sort of reading at a certain pace. The pace changes, the flow chain changes, the, the, the feel, the mood. Um, he's using language, to, the structural properties of, of, of language and sentence structures um, to change moods. Um, uh, so he's manipulating that in a musical way. So it's often referred to as a kind of a very musical writer, which I think, I think, is, I think that's interesting too. Um, so like when the characters are, are running up the stairs through, uh, towards the end towards the end of the story, um, they the kind of, the, the the sentence becomes long and drawn out, and you almost kind of feel like you're running up the stairs, in, you know, in a dramatic fit of uh, impassioned love, uh, as the characters were. So, uh, so that's I, I think, uh, yeah, um, they're the main port, points that I, I, I want to make about Chekhov, um, and uh, so. That's it for the lecture part, and now we'll get on to some activities. Thank you.